There's not one guy, one person in the history of this program that's bigger than the program. What's better than this? Guys being dudes. Ooh, what's up and welcome into episode number 27 of the Program Guys podcast. My name is Mason Prince. I am joined with you as always by Matt Gann, Mark Hall, Patrick Kurtzberger. No Ryan Tyson this week. He's being a working man in New York. We miss you, Ryan. Today is Wednesday, July 13th. It is hot as hell in the state of Oklahoma. I'm sure it's hot as hell down in Texas, but I bet it feels good in California, Pat. How you doing? It's 70 and sunny. It's a nice day. Unbelievable. Mm, I just got got back from Mexico. I was on vacation last week. If you listened, great episode last week that the guys pulled off. Big thank you to Ryan Heil for subbing in with that. Really appreciate it. Uh, go back and listen if you want to check that out. How's everybody doing this week, Matt? I see you got your Aaron Rodgers jersey on. Appreciate it. we're teeing it up. It's I'm coming. rocking. I'm rocking my Baker jersey today. Free Baker. He is freed mm-hmm. on the Carolina yeah. Panthers officially. As of oh, Tuesday. we didn't get you and Pat's takes on that because y'all yeah. were gone. Yeah, um, I want to give a week. quick dish. I'm very happy for Baker. I'm glad that they say it's an open competition for quarterback. But if you legit think that. Sam Darnold has a shot to win that job. You haven't been watching football. Like to say that Baker and Sam Darnold are on the same level is just complete and total BS. Like, and I hope Rob, I hope Robbie Anderson never catches another pass. Cause if that's the dude he wants to hitch his wagon to, he's high. Like well, it's, it's bad. Robbie Anderson came up in New York with Sam Darnold. So there's some of that, but, but okay, yeah, I agree. agreed. But if you have came a better up- year with Baker, if you came up helm. with him in New York and saw him play in New York and then you saw him play in Carolina and you're still like, that's my guy, you're <laughs> you're insane. You're yeah. an insane person yeah. and you don't deserve to catch another pass because if that's what you think you want to hit your wagon to other than this Baker guy, then you're stupid. I don't disagree, but we do have Gann on the pod still. So, uh, you know, mm. sometimes you stick with your guys. You're, you know? you're right. That's, you got to do what you got to do. You're right. Hey, absolutely. People, Pat, what do you, people bring something? What do you think, Pat? Oh, I'm pumped for him. I think I agree with you. I, he's. I think he's going to turn that team around. It's going to be fun to watch. I I'm very excited. Week one, Browns Panthers. That'll be a good time. I'm interested to see what happens there. Baker and his press conferences today. His introductory press conferences were official. He he, in typical Baker fashion, said, "I'm not going to you know BS it and tell you guys play dumb like." I have that game circled. So that's why we love Baker. <laughs> like he's, he's going to tell it like it is every time he's not going to give you coach speak. And I, that's why I love him. And that's why it, OU fans love him. It would be stupid not to start him that game. A hundred percent. Like even oh, if think, you, even if you're leading Sam for some stupid reason, uh, you know, you got to yeah. start him. They're you know going what I, to call it an open competition and I'm sure yeah. that it will be. And they but have to. The expectation is, because Baker's a better quarterback, he'll win that job. Yeah. yeah. If I'm Matt Rule or if I'm Baker, I go in and show him what I, what I did to Texas Tech in college and be like, this is what's going to happen if you play me against the Browns. And Matt should just be like, yeah, cool. You're in. Like, that. that's what he should do. We got this McCaffrey guy. Try throwing that same ball to him on the sideline. Let's yeah. see what happens. Dude, no joke. No joke. All right, well – Let's get into some NFL news. We got a great interview coming up for you in a little bit with Josh Calloway of SI Sooners and All Sooners podcast. He's going to Big 12 Media Days. Stick around for that. We'll get to that in just a second. But first, guys, I want to talk about just a little bit NFL news. We're in the dog days of summer for sure. Uh, The baseball all-star break is coming up. We're not going to talk baseball. But some NFL news coming out. Just a little fun. Uh, Top 10 quarterbacks came out ranked by the NFL executives. We have Aaron Rodgers, the number one, Mahomes, two, Allen, three, Brady, four, Burrow, five, Stafford, sixth, Herbert, seventh, Russell Wilson, eighth, Deshaun Watson, ninth, Dak Prescott, tenth. Is that not Zach Wilson, eight? (laughs) No, he he should be MVP. He should be, yeah. He should Uh, be MVP. He was my MVP. I just took him out, though. Dude, Zach... We'll we'll get, to that. We'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that later because that's that's a, that's amazing. Wilson. You guys you guys see that list? Any omissions or any problem with the order of that list? I have. I just one think... big one stands out to me. Go, yeah, yeah, go. Thumb for sure. What, what are we? What are we? 
how much can we possibly overrate a Super Bowl run for Joe Burrow? Yeah, I know. Yeah. Because five? I know. Five's so a he's lot. better yeah. than Stafford, who they beat him in a yeah. aforementioned Super Bowl? I don't think so, guys. I don't know about that. I also have trouble even saying he's above Russell Wilson when you give Russell Wilson the kind of weapons he'll have in Denver this, this is, year. Yeah, yeah. This is the as problem. good as Seattle. What are you talking about, man? You that think is. he's got better talent than DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett? Yeah, because they have like four receivers oh in Denver. Uh, they've got Alberto at tight end, who plays tight end. You are some. I love this new dynamic running with me, Mark and, and Mark. You are and they've smoking. got two good running backs in Melvin Gordon and Javante Williams. He came back. Too. Yeah, Tyler Lockett. Oh I man, guarantee Kill you, me. he has a better year this year with the Denver Broncos than he did with the Seattle Seahawks. Yeah, good luck in that division for sure. Hey, guarantee it. The the division will be tough for sure. I to Mark's point about Joe Burrow. I think this is the problem that we always run into with the NFL and everybody wants there to be the next goat, like the next guy who's going to run the league. And people are so ready to latch onto that because they know Brady's retiring. They know Rogers is on the tail end. They want that next guy who is going to be the poster child of the NFL. And they think it's going to be Joe Burrow. I don't know if it is, but after last season, people are putting they're going all in and they're and they're ready to call it now. So that's just kind of where I think that comes from. So I think it's recency. Super, the Super, Bowl, Super Bowl run helps. Go ahead. Matt. Yeah, it's Sorry. recency yeah. bias. I would say. I mean, they had a great run to the Super Bowl, but I wouldn't call it a fluke of a year. But I got to see more. I got to see if they are consistent. Let's see what happens this year, right? So, again, I think the order – I think it's 1A, 1B between Aaron Rodgers and Brady. I don't know how you put Brady at number four. That just seems very yeah. illogical to me. We haven't even talked about it, but come on, guys. Deshaun Watson at number nine. I don't even know how we can consider him wait, top, wait. top ten at this moment when he hasn't played and however long he still has all of his issues off field. When he does play, I think he's top five, but I, I just wouldn't consider him at this moment – with all the legal stuff going on. He might not even play another snap of football ever again. So I have a problem with that. I have a problem with Joe Burrow. And we're omitting an MVP in Lamar Jackson. Patrick's Thank boy. You. He's not Thank even you. on the – I would take out Deshaun Watson. I would push Burrow back, and I would have Lamar somewhere and probably in that seven or eight range. I just don't know how, how you leave out a former MVP out of the top ten list. Crazy to me. Go ahead, Mark. Okay, you said like a lot of things there. Uh, yep. I agree with you on Lamar. He he should be on this list absolutely above. Like, why isn't he above Burrow and almost everyone there? That's um, what I'm saying. Burrow should be pushed all the way back. I think Burrow should be like nine or ten. I think Lamar should be in that six seven range, just kind of looking there. Totally so. agree with that. The Deshaun thing, I, you know, they had their their way of doing it, and I'm sure some voters didn't include him, and that's why he's at nine. So. That's another yeah. conversation for another day. Right. Where, when you said, why is Brady at four? Why do you say that? Like he should be higher. He should be lower. Yeah. I think, Bra I think Brady and Rogers should almost be one A and one B at this point until one of them retire. I don't think either one of them should be so, above the other, so, but I'm so surprised see. Mahomes and Allen are above Tom Brady at this point, especially gotcha. when Tom Brady almost had one of his best seasons all time just a couple years ago. At 44. I mean, that's yeah, ridiculous. And that's, I, I completely agree with Matt there. I'm once I said it during the season, during Brady's playoff run, I'm to the point now where I'm not going to discount anything Brady does until he digress or until he gets yeah. worse. And he doesn't, he doesn't get worse. Never so, gets worse. so he, <clears throat> he deserves to be either 1A or 1B, in my opinion. And because when you're the GOAT and you continue to play at the level that he does, there's no reason that you should Ridiculous. be be that low. Patrick? Yeah. My man, Lamar, you guys said it. He got snubbed. That's ridiculous. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think I think he should be yeah, number three at least. No, I'm just kidding. But <laughs> he should be in that list for sure. Other things that stand out to me, I'm just not a big Herbert guy yet. I don't think he's proven enough. I get it. He's got a great arm. He's an athletic guy. But just to me, Herbert is just not a proven quarterback and shouldn't even be in that list in my opinion. He's got um, the stats, and that's what – he's got the stats, yeah. and that's what gets – And a crazy arm. I know, yeah. I know, but 
I don't, we'll see. We'll see this year, especially because the Chargers are, should be really good. So if he doesn't bring them to the playoffs and maybe even make a run in the playoffs, we'll see. see and that's where, we'll that's see. where I agree with you, Patrick, is you look at that and pretty much every quarterback on that list has some sort of playoff experience besides Herbert. Yeah. So that's my issue with Herbert being there. I am not discounting Herbert's athletic ability and his talent because he is extremely talented, but that has to count for something. Yeah. Man, it's yeah. so crazy that all the, like, you guys are right. I'm looking at this list and almost everyone's won the Super Bowl or gotten close to it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And all these execs and coaches and scouts and players are still like, yeah, this Herbert guy. Yeah. That's crazy to me because mm-hmm. I, that's such a good point. And, and Everyone not, else has like had postseason success. Yeah. And I'm just not a Dak Prescott guy. I, I wouldn't consider him a top 10 either. But I understand that he has the ability to be a, a top 10 quarterback. It's just for me. I think yeah, I yeah. could see like Kyler there maybe. But the thing is, Kyler has the capability of doing it, but he's always hurt the back half of the year. Yeah. Whereas Dak, if he's healthy, he's giving you consistent play. And I think the I think the Dak thing is somebody's got to be ten, and the list starts getting thin when you get to that point. And to March point, Kyler could be a guy you can make the argument for, but somebody's got to be ten. And when the talent pool starts shrinking, and you look at the rest of the league and the quarterbacks, and you're just not really impressed with anybody else, Dak's probably giving you the most. So yeah. that's. I think that's where that comes from. Dak's sample size is bigger and more impressive than Kyler's. That's just where I'm at. So that's why I get him being 10. I'll just say one last thing. Yeah. I actually am kind of questioning Patrick Mahomes at two, especially now he's going to his first year without arguably one of the best wide receivers in the league and Tyree Kill, obviously going to Miami. So obviously he's still got a good caliber of wide receivers and obviously Travis Kelsey. But it's going to be really interesting to see how Patrick Mahomes. I don't think there will be a significant drop off. It'll be interesting to see when he can't just chunk it down the field to the the cheetah himself. Uh, so that'll be interesting to see as well. Fam, I need this. Is, this is completely off topic, and we're not going to go deep into this. I need Tyree Kill to shut the hell up. I need him <laughs> to stop talking. Yeah, because he's not helping Tua, and he's not helping the team. <clears throat> he is like putting Tua already had pressure on him. He didn't need the best arguably the best receiver in the league to put more on him and like talk a bunch of mess about how two is like just as good as Patrick Mahomes. I like, we don't need that at all. And it's driving me nuts. The reason I bring this up, Mark texted me earlier in the week and was like, dude, Tyreek's got to stop. And the, and it's partly because I figured this out. Tyreek has his own podcast that he does like, two times a week. Mm. So literally just gets on there and talks about like his experience, his team, which yeah. is, which is his team and the dolphins and Tua. It drives me insane. We don't need to do this. We no. don't. I'm but. against player pods. Let guys like guys like us do it. You know, <laughs> let the pros handle it. <laughs> let the pros, let the handle, pros it. handle it. Aren't you right? That's I'll, good. I'll well, say one thing. They did yeah. get the number one guy, right? My boy Rogers back to back MVP. I feel like that was pretty easily the most, Easy decision made. What so do you think of his, what do you think boy. of his tattoo? You know, uh yeah, that's all as long as it doesn't affect it. him throwing a football, I could care less. That's his personal life, that's his body, that's his is temple. It, so. Is it on his throwing arm? I don't even know. Uh, I'm actually not sure. I don't, I don't even know. I don't even know like who this guy is anymore. Yeah, <laughs> he's just he's just a back weird to back dude. MVPs, baby. That's all you need to know. He's just a weird Matt. Dude. Are you Matt? Are you uh expecting an MVP level season this year without Devonte, because Derek Carr is another guy that could be on this list and <laughs> probably will be after yeah. a, a year with Devonte Adams. Yeah, it's a good question, especially when you lose arguably the top wide receiver in the league for the last three years, uh, definitely going to be a significant drop off. The offense is going to be definitely going to squander quite a bit. Obviously you saw what happened when he doesn't have a second option and now they don't have a clear number one. So they were really going to have to rely on on Dylan and AJ, or I'm sorry, Dylan and Jones out of the backfield a lot this year. So definitely drop off, but the defense will be a top three unit. So La- last thing for you, yeah. man. La- last thing I just want to on the record that I completely agree with Mark. I think I've said it before, and if I haven't, I'm going to say it again. 
I think Derek Carr is extremely underrated and does not get enough credit. I would love to have Derek Carr as my quarterback. I think he is, I don't think he's like great, but I think he deserves way more credit than he gets. And yep. people dog on him for whatever reason. I'm not really sure why, but with Devonte Adams, I agree with Mark, watch out. He's, he's easily going to be in that conversation next year. 100%. Let's move on to some NBA news. NBA Summer League in the middle of it right now. We're not going to break down any Summer League or anything by any means, and we're not going to have a debate between Mark and Matt again. By the way, Mark won. That's my opinion. Yeah. I, I had a but four for Mark and a three for Matt. Yeah. That's fair. It doesn't matter. That's fair. It, 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 it's, like the it's Rockets whatever. future. We'll, yeah. We're going to – we'll move on from that. NBA Board of Governors are voting on the future of playing games and the in-season tournament and play in games, play in games are going to continue for future seasons. Thoughts overall on that? We'll start with Pat. Really? Hey yeah, Patrick. Buddy. <laughs> Patrick, what is the play in game? Yeah, I, think I just wanted to catch you else. off guard. You know, I was just gonna catch <laughs> you off guard. Is, I yeah, know this one's not my wheelhouse. <laughs> Dude, I don't I don't keep up with the NBA unless they're in season, essentially. Yeah. Like that's just my thing. So Mark or Matt, let's go, let's go with you guys. Tell tell me what I should like or not like about this. Yeah, so, I'll let, yeah, go ahead, Mark. You're the basketball guy. Go for the, it. The way the play-in game works more or less is the nine and ten seeds have a chance of taking the seven and eight seeds from the seven and eight seeds. And basically it it widens the pool of competitive teams at the end of the year. So it's a competitive measure and an anti-tanking measure at the same time, which is pretty cool. And it creates a good bit of drama at the end of the year. I think it sort of devalues the 82 game season that's played. And I don't understand why we play 82 games only to let like a two out of three tournament decide what's actually going to, you know, who, who gets to go to the playoffs. And, you know, when you put it down to its core, get playoff revenue from it. You turn an 82 game contest to see who is able to get those playoff games into a three game, you know, winner takes all. And, you know, so entertainment goes up, but maybe competitive value goes down for me. Anything, anything, Matt? Yeah, it'll be interesting to see with the end season tournament. Have you heard anything more about that, Mark? What that would actually even look like, or if they did approve you it? You got to assume that would it's actually... some sort of soccer. Like they they got to model it after soccer. There's no yeah. other way to do it. I don't see any way you can possibly incentive got incentivize real NBA players right. to put their seasons at risk by playing an end season tournament. Unless it the, make sense to unless me. the unless the players association negotiates for more money in contracts, that's sure. the only way. Right there because sure. they're playing more games, therefore they should be paid more money. You want me and, to do two playoffs? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tell tell LeBron James he's got to go play more games on in the in the in season tournament or whatever it is. Good right. luck with that. Yeah, yeah. he he's gonna sit. Do some load management. Yeah. All right, well, we'll see what happens with the NBA. Moving on to some NCAA football news. Conference realignment has slowed down significantly. I feel like at this point, we're kind of just waiting to see what Notre Dame does and what happens with the ACC, and I'm not sure we're going to see it the rest of this year. It's It seems as though it's slowed down, but I feel like Notre Dame is either going to be an SEC team or a Big Ten team, which one is it going to be? I think it makes the most sense for them to be a Big Ten team academically yeah. and where they're located. But obviously location. location means literally nothing anymore. So, but I just think they fit in more in the Big Ten. Anybody anybody else agree or disagree? I, I agree. I, I could see them coming in with Oregon. That would probably mm -hmm. be a good compromise for the Big Ten. And a good That's way fair. to bring in Oregon too. Yeah. Matt? Yeah, I was just thinking. Besides Notre Dame, I'm just thinking Oregon, Washington, probably are two left out there that will end up joining somewhere. And then probably you got to look to the ACC and Florida State and Clemson. There's don't think they're going to want to stay in the ACC at this point. So I would think they would probably move to the SEC 
And again, we're just going to have two mega conferences. So I think there's Miami. probably about five or six programs out there that are probably still looking to move. But Miami ain't going to stay. Sure. Miami yeah, will Miami, go somewhere. Uh, Miami will go to the SEC good probably. Point. Yeah. That, that's just another name that pop that pops up. Mark? Yeah, the thing with the Notre Dame, there's no way they come to the SEC. There are just academic standards that are held at Notre Dame that they're very stuffy about, and they're not going to, in their minds, stoop to come play to the SEC. They're going to go to the Big Ten if they do anything. I could also see Notre Dame try and stay independent in all this, but I think that that's a fool's errand. Yeah. Um, as far as other teams, you know, Oregon and Washington, obviously Stanford needs something to do, right? They're always a big name in college athletics, even if not always college football. So yeah. they need to find a home. And uh, on uh, the ACC side of things, you know, you've got Clemson, North Carolina, there were reports that the SEC was in conversations with Virginia and uh, not yet Miami. And uh, I think it'd be interesting to see if these conferences, you know, do their musical chairs and uh, maybe Miami is left out without a chair because I don't know if I'd want to deal with this Ruiz guy. And I don't know if I'd want to deal with everything that comes with like, a full powered Miami team. Cause it's a lot. It's yeah. a whole media circus. It's, it's a different kind of ball game. And if you can get other teams to like Clemson to come in, North Carolina to come in, why wouldn't you? Another point with all the teams coming in, are they going to start kicking teams out or just leaving and creating a different, a different league or, you know, division that doesn't include a Rutgers or uh, uh, Vanderbilt, like at some point that's got to start happening. You, there's only so much room for a team, like a certain amount of teams in a conference. Teams need sense. to lose too, though. Mm -hmm. Someone's got to lose. <sighs> yeah. I mean, yeah, but still. Well, who mentioned it the other, was it last week or maybe the week before someone mentioned relegation? Yeah. Mark made an incredible <laughs> point about relegation and I completely Thank you, agree with that. But there yeah, is I don't know if that like will that. ever happen. Yeah, but there does. It is, it is interesting to think about because they are going to have to move around. It's all about money at the end of the day. Be interesting to see. I mean, it did. I I think Matt was right. It's going to essentially be two super conferences, and that's just what's going to have to happen. And there's going to be 30 teams in each conference or something like that. 30 is an exaggeration, probably, yeah. but you you know where I'm you know what I'm talking about. So I think the ACC is going to get picked apart, and the Pac-12 is going to get picked apart, and we'll we'll see where the pieces fall after that. Uh, the Big 12 will stay together. I think their new commissioner will will hold down the fort, and especially with the new teams coming in, they'll be okay. But yeah, just it's it's weird. The the landscape's changing, and it it's cyclical. Like everything always changes. You know, it it it's not going to stay the same forever, but. Here, here we are. We're in the middle of it right now. Yep. Let's move on to our interview with Josh Calloway of All Sooners. Take it away right now. Three, two, one. We now welcome on our first time guest, Josh Calloway. He is the multimedia director, assistant editor of All Sooners and the host of the All Sooners podcast. Josh, did I get that right? You nailed it. Yeah, it's a bit I, of a mouthful, but you nailed it. Yeah. All right. Well, well, I did it. He's rocking the mustache just like Mark. I'm trying to rock mine as yes, well. <laughs> Josh, the reason we had him on, he's in Dallas. He or is it in Dallas? The Big 12 Media Days? I don't know. Arlington, remember. right? Arlington, yeah. Arlington. Cowboys Stadium. So yeah, See, close enough. Okay, so Josh, I'm kind of older. I when I went to Big 12 Media Days, when I was a journalist, it was in Dallas at the Omni in downtown Dallas. So oh, yeah. I never got to go to like Jerry's world and see like the cool stuff that they had at Jerry's world. So yeah, yeah the I, first time I went, it was actually at the star in Frisco. Yeah. That, that's where it I was. And they that. moved it over to Cowboy State. That's where it's been the last, I don't know, few, few times, but uh, it's a good event. Big 12 media days is a good event. You look at, I've never been to the other conferences media days, but when you look at them on TV and stuff, they all look like they're, they're always in like a hotel or something that like they look like they're a lot more compact Big Media Days is very big, open. It's a good event. You know, people make fun of the Big 12, but it, it's uh, they do a pretty nice job, I think, uh, relatively. 
Yeah, having SEC. Jerry World in Dallas is such a regional advantage to yeah. the Big Twelve. Like that Big sure. Twelve championship game, Media Day, all of it. They just Jerry's right sure. there. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, SEC Media Days in Hoover, Alabama, is like they take over the entire hotel. Like that's all it is. Is SEC Media? Sure. It's, I've never seen anything like it, and you'll probably get to experience it in a couple of years when OU yeah, goes probably. goes down there. So we, we brought you on. We wanted to talk to you about Big 12 Media Days starting on Wednesday. If you're listening to this, we're recording this on Tuesday afternoon. We're going to air this on Wednesday morning. Uh, you'll hear this when you wake up. So it'll be Big 12 Media Days time. And for me, Josh, it always feels like the unofficial start of football season. I know there's a lot of unofficial starts, but for me, as a guy who's been to Big 12 Media Days, this really feels like the start of football season. What do you think? I agree completely. You know, it feels like it's when you start to turn the corner uh, a little bit. You get those preseason polls and, you know, the preseason all-conference teams and, and stuff like that. And this is – Big 12 is awesome. Uh, it's an opportunity because, obviously, we look forward – we haven't heard from, you know, in this case, Brent Venables or any of these players in over, you know, three months you know, since the spring game. That's the last time we got to hear from any of these guys, really. But – and while we look forward to that, it's also an opportunity to hear from the other nine teams. I mean, we don't – how many times do we get the chance to go talk to Mike Gundy or, you know, Dave Aranda or whatever? I mean, it, it doesn't really happen over the course of a season. So it's nice to get that opportunity. It does feel like you kind of start to turn a corner this year, especially with just all the change. There's, there's some more interest. I mean, new commish, new uh, realignment as whole has happened. I mean, last year when Beach media has happened, it was, it was pre pre sec move. He was even announced, you know what I mean? So a lot has happened since the last time we got to do this. It, it, it is a, a fruitful event. It's nice. And, I agree completely. It, it feels like the start of football in a sense because, you know, you're just a couple weeks after this is when fall camp starts and, oh, you'll have their media day, their local one in Norman. And so it, it feels like this is kind of the kickoff. Everybody kind of gets their vacations in before this. And it's like everybody comes back from vacation. Everybody gets down to Arlington. It's kind of kicks it off uh, in a way of, all right, kind of lock back in because season is right around the corner. So, Josh, what are you most looking forward to hearing besides the OU the OU crowd because you you just talked about it this is really the first time or the only time all year that we get to hear about other coaches Baylor picked to win the conference uh 17 first place votes are you looking forward to hearing what Dave Aranda and that Baylor squad has to say or maybe is it Steve Sarkeesian or Mike Gundy like you said what are you looking at yeah yeah there's a lot um frankly I mean yeah for all the OU stuff because we you know we got to talk to you know Venables and these guys about that SEC move and stuff like that Texas for sure I mean Steve Sarkeesian and, and that that group the guys who were left behind Oklahoma State especially obviously there was a lot of animosity there you know when the when the move was announced last year I think you know the news since then the teams that they're bringing in um, obviously the whole the Big Ten moves I and mean, there's a lot that's happened since last year's Big Twelve Media Days a full season of NIL how's that playing out how have the teams and coaches seen that you know, shaking out over the first year of that being a thing, obviously. I mean, there's there's a lot of intrigue. Uh, Baylor, you know, certainly being the, I don't know, I guess the top dog in a sense. I mean, defending champs, pretty number one. That's not something they're totally used to, obviously. So that is certainly interesting. I mean, OU's been number one in the preseason every year since 2015. I mean, it's been a long time since they weren't the projected to win the conference, usually going away, usually heavy favor, you know, so – it's a bit of a different looking league uh, this year than it has been in, in the past. So definitely some intrigue there. Always, it's always fun to hear from new guys too, like Sonny Dykes, you know, coming in, Joey McGuire, you know, just the ones you haven't got to hear from yet. We don't know them very well. We haven't, you know, we don't really totally know what they're like and you kind of know from afar, but it's nice to get to actually hear them, you know, in press conference format. Cause obviously, and you know, from being there, you have your press conference, which is a big one, big open. It's, you know, hundreds of media literally, but then they do the breakouts which is really when it's at its best because it's everybody's available at once for like an hour or two hours, however long it is. And that's when you get to really get the chance to go just kind of walk around and, and talk to everybody. So I look forward to that kind of a thing because th this, this is always a fun event because while it's a start of football for us and it's all that, it's a start of football for a lot of these guys too. Everybody's in a good mood at Big Media. Everybody's cracking jokes. Everybody's feeling good. Everybody's zero and zero. You know, everybody is one of those type of things. So it's uh it's, it's fun to get here from the new guys and, and certainly just, all the changes in college football in general uh, since the last time we did this is going to be interesting to hear about. The point you made about OU being favored every year since 15 and this yeah. year not being favored, the football aspect of it is so interesting to me and how teams like Baylor, teams like Oklahoma State, you know, historically we are 
like kind of the big dog with the target on our back. And this sure. year, that's not really the case, right? They're downplaying Venables and OU's dead, whatever. That's all overspoken. But I'm excited to see how these guys approach their positions as, hey, we might be the guy in this conference now. We might like Dave Aranda, Mike mm-hmm. Gundy, these guys who are at the top. Do you think we'll see a different tone from some of these coaches who have constantly had to look up at OU now sort of thinking they're eye to eye? Yeah, I'm very interested in that because it's such a weird dichotomy this summer of, of, you know, it seems like half half of, you know, the country wants to throw dirt on Oklahoma. You know, it's kind of painted them as the next Nebraska, kind of going to fall off a, a cliff because of the move and because of Lincoln leaving and, and all this stuff. Another half are, are still saying they're going to be just fine. You know, Brent Venable's going to be just fine. But I do think that pretty much across the board, and obviously when you're around the team all the time, like, like, I am, or, or obviously you guys, you keep up the team all the time. We see it as it's going to be fine. And, you know, I'd be surprised if it's not fine. And I don't think they're going to fall off much at all. But I, I do think that generally OU is looked as vulnerable uh, right now. This is the kind of the time to strike uh, pretty much on Oklahoma, this transition. Oh, you know, they did lose a significant amount, obviously, in the transfer portal in the draft. They're vulnerable right now. They're beatable, as beatable as they've been. So I'm, I'm curious if, especially the players, I don't think Dave Aranda is going to say anything or, or Mike Gundy. I mean, Dave Aranda especially is extremely soft-spoken. He, he's never one to uh, say anything to, to bulletin board or anything. But some of these players, especially in those breakouts, like I mentioned, some of these players, you know, if, if you you might get them to, to say something um, about that's the about right table. question here and there. Yeah, absolutely. So that, that's going to be the fun part because I think definitely, and especially the first day, oh, I'm used to Oklahoma always going on the first day. It seems like they're always one of the first teams up. They don't go until day two this time. So that first day, Baylor and Oklahoma State are both going. So yeah, I think it'll be interesting to hear from those guys and kind of, you know, especially Spencer Sanders has, has shown a willingness to, to uh, like last year in the lead up to Bedlam, he's shown a willingness to, to speak up. Um, I think there's some, some interesting potential there uh, from, from those guys. I cannot believe he's still around. Yeah, I know. Still around. And then Mason goes, goes, but I cannot believe it. It's, it's, <laughs> it's crazy. And it's funny you mentioned Spencer Sanders. It's something that I wanted to get to now. He is the first team all big 12 quarterback based on voting. If, if you don't follow Josh on Twitter, you should at Josh M Calloway. He has some really good tweets. You had one earlier in the week that, or it was last week, I should say when these teams came out and it was Brent Venable saying team 128, you will get what you earn dirty, hard work in the dark. And you said yeah. quickly learning that Brent Venables may not necessarily seem like the type, but this dude definitely keeps receipts. And I completely agree with that statement. Yeah. He definitely seems like that kind of guy. How motivated do you think this team is going to be? And were you shocked as a voter that there, that Michael Turk was really the only guy, well, you can include Dylan Gabriel as a newcomer, but the only guys sure. that were on the team. Yeah. I mean, I'll start there. I, I do think it was a little surprised. I mean, they have small big 12 caliber guys on this team. I mean, I, I understand that there is a bit of a transition, a bit of unknown with the team. I mean, Marvin Mims is an all big 12 receiver to me. Um, That's the one. I think Woody Washington certainly has an argument. Key Lawrence has an argument. Um, Jalen Redmond has an argument. Maybe Jalen Jalen Redmond, when he's healthy, the only year he's really been healthy, he led the Big 12 in sacks. You know what I mean? So, but, you know, I do think that this team absolutely is feeding off this big time. Um, The, the, everything we just said, you know, throwing dirt in Oklahoma, next Nebraska, going to fall off a cliff. And now no all Big 12 guys except for their punter. And, um, but that being said, they're still picked second, but even so, you know, looking forward to, you know, the opportunity to be the underdog. So the Oklahoma doesn't get to be in the big 12 very often. Um, and they're certainly going to be that. And Brent Venables, you know, to go back to that point, he seems like an old school guy and everything, but he absolutely makes notes of these types of things. And he's ready to, to prove people wrong himself. He, he hears it. He hears it. There's a lot of people, which is kind of crazy, but there's a lot of people that doubt Brent Venables ability to, to lead a program himself. And he's never done it. And I get that, but I mean, Lincoln Riley had never done it. Um, Bob Stoops obviously had never done it. First time head coach is what OU does. You know what I mean? So um, I definitely think he's making notes and he's he's telling these guys. And, and that Team 128 thing has been one of his biggest staples, one of his biggest things he brings up all the time in terms of, you know, the previous 127 teams don't really matter. It's about this year's team, um, you know, and telling these guys that OU is great. They're going to continue to be great, but this is your chance to make this year's team yours. You know what I mean? So um, it's going to be interesting. I, I definitely – I'm interested. That's one of the more intriguing aspects for for Oklahoma specifically at Big 12 Media Days. It's just because it's going to come up, you know, no B12 guys, you know, not only pick, pick second this year, first time in seven years, stuff like that. That's going to come up, and I'm curious to hear 
uh, what these guys say, um, certainly here in the next couple of days. Do we know who uh, Texas is sending? Is Quinn Ewers going? I have it. Quinn Ewers is not going. I'm pretty sure. I have it right here, though. Let's see. Yeah, I wouldn't send him it. Okay, that was it. my so my question handy. was a follow up for come, a come. Quinn Ewers appearance, but yeah. I don't think. Yeah, Roshan Johnson, uh, B. J. Robinson, Demario Overshown, and uh, I struggle sure with the name Ogulu Ogu Ogufu Ogu, the line defensive end. Hey, you'll really find out tomorrow, or you'll you'll find out tomorrow how you say it, right? You know? Yeah, I think that's yeah, exactly. day. I've never three? had to say it. We just read it. Day three. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so, Josh, I my my next question is: We see the guys who are going: Dylan Gabriel, Ethan Downs, Marvin Mims, Woody Washington. To me, Big Twelve Media Days always kind of means like who you send is who you want representing your team, and Brent Venables takes that to heart one hundred percent. And seeing that roster of guys who are going down there, OU fans may not realize, but quarterbacks at OU haven't gone to Big 12 media days in the past, like in a a long time. So the fact that Dylan Gabriel, his first year on the team, going down to represent this team says a whole lot to me about what Brent Venables and this staff thinks of him right now. Yeah, 100%. I mean, Baker was the last time quarterback went. Um, I I know it's going to come off as a a Lincoln bashing. Thing. I don't really mean it that way, but it's refreshing in that there's not there's not this hiding uh, of guys you know, keeping Spencer Rattler back, keeping not not any fake quarterback battle, which is nice. You know, Jeff Lebby announced that oh you, that Gabriel's going to start like it was like January before they even done. Yeah, he's going <laughs> to yeah. start. Like he's obviously going to start. You know what I mean? I I really appreciate that because um, we've had just kind of silliness in this area for the last several years. You know, and, and that was part of it was not sending. Spencer Rattler to um, to to Beach Hill Media's last year, which seemed like such a weird move, and it was it feels like forever ago. But that was a hot topic last summer. Was how are they not sending Spencer Rattler? That that's crazy. Yeah, he can know? make and time it, to be in Chicago signing autographs, but he's right, not a, right, you know, exactly. media. Yeah. So it it has been refreshing in that regard that they've been throwing Gabriel right out there, and that that speaks to the whole spring mm-hmm. too. I mean, we got just about every single player of of consequence at all in the spring at some point, which you know. Again, not to just bash on Lincoln or anything, but it was barely guarded before. We know, we didn't get Caleb Lives all season. You know what I mean? We we didn't get to hear from a lot of players. We only heard from about the same like 10 or 15 guys all year. In the spring, we heard from just about literally everyone. They throw everybody out there. They're very open. We got to go to practice a few times. You know what I mean? Like it was very open um, throughout the spring. I think this is part of it. And it does speak to what they think of Dylan Gabriel. And Brent Venables has spoken really highly of him. Um, stepped in as an immediate leader. I, all the players seem to love him. Um, receivers are excited to play with him. He had that dime time retreat. I'm sure you guys saw where he invited a bunch of the guys out. You know, they had a big, big event thing. It's cool, cool stuff, you know, cool stuff, leader stuff. And um, it seems like everybody's really embracing him. He's been awesome when he's got to talk to us. He's a super well spoken kid and he's he's ingratiated himself quickly. Um, and that that goes to show it. So it is nice that he's gonna be there. While it may seem obvious, like you said, I mean it. It's first time since Baker. Kyler didn't get to go. Uh, Spencer Rowley didn't get to go. You know what I mean? Jalen Hurts didn't go. You know, I mean, it, it's it's been a long time since we got to actually have the quarterback there. So uh, it's going to be a nice little change of pace. I think it speaks a lot to what this staff and administration, I guess, sees out of Dylan Gabriel that mm-hmm. since his transfer, he's almost been like a part of the brain trust with them as far as yeah. he's the one on the on the offense, you know, calling out the play, shouting at people. It's not Jeff Levy sprinting onto the field during the spring game. He's on top of it. He's organizing the dime time retreat, at least for this year. It seems like they've decided Hey Dylan, you're our guy no matter what, unless you know we start two and three, something crazy. Sure. We're hitching our wagon to you. Go lead this team, and this is just another example of that. Sure, yeah, I mean, and they, you know, they, they've put a lot of faith in him, a lot of eggs in that basket. And look, I mean, obviously, they've admitted, the players admitted that this that spring was really hard. I mean, they're learning a new offense. And Jeff Levy's offense is really fast. I mean, you guys saw that in the spring game. It it's absurd how quickly that they run run through the defense in spring was talking about geez, they, they're going to keep guys winded because they go really fast and yeah. it helps that Dylan Gabriel has experience there, you know, with, with Levy back at UCF and um, they've leaned on him. And I, I can't remember who it was. Somebody offensive line said that Gabriel will frequently call out their blocking assignments for them, you know, before plays. And he's kind of, he's kind of the offensive coordinator on the field and they need yeah. that. Cause I mean, 
defense is learning new stuff. Offense is learning new stuff. Um, you know, while a lot of the offensive staff is the same, obviously it's a totally different offense with, <clears throat> with Levy running it instead of Lincoln. And so there, there's a lot of learning being done on the fly here for this team. So the fact that Dylan Gabriel isn't having to learn as much, your quarterback really helps. And he can kind of be a de facto coach, you know, kind of in a way. And he's a very mature guy and, and the, the leadership stuff comes natural to him. So that, that part's just kind of gravy. Um, but yeah, no, they're, they're really leaning on him hard. Um, that's why it has been, extremely important they keep him healthy obviously because behind him it's a lot of inexperience they had to get oh, somebody yeah. to transfer portal and they did davis bell from pittsburgh who's got a little bit of experience at least at least more than what they had before general um, booty too i'm high on general them. booty yeah general booty from the juco ranks i mean they're they're um obviously all their eggs are in the gabriel basket for sure and um he, he's you know they, they've thrown him right to the forefront as being a face of the program type of guy right away let him play both teams in the spring game you know stuff like that i mean he is He's right away as, you know, this is our guy. He'll be a captain, I'm certain, um, oh, yeah. and all that. He's He stepped right in as, you know, kind of a face of the program type of thing, which is what you want, you know, from your quarterback. It seems like all four guys they sent could be captains. Like this was sure. a captaincy. Even Downs, even yeah. Downs is crazy impressive. Um, it's been awesome to see how quickly he's risen. Um, that was not – he was the biggest surprise. Mims and Woody and Gabriel were all kind of like – Almost give as that they would be there. I was surprised that Ethan Downs is going down, but not at the same time. I'm surprised, but not because he is really well spoken, um, program guy, you know, company man type of thing. Um, he, he, uh, yeah, he, he's, he's awesome, and he's a really talented player. He's going to be really good. He's, he's got potential to be great by the time his time's done. I got to call him a couple times in high school at Weatherford. He was just, it was hilarious. Like he would just dominate people. He played both offense and defense, and he. He's been great so far, and you can see him quickly, you know, kind of climbing the ladder as a, like a leader and all that kind of stuff. The fact that he's sending, they're sending him to media days is, speaks a lot about him as a younger guy. Right. I'm not asking you to break down the overall media psyche or break Hopefully. down, <laughs> you know, <laughs> other, other people's psyche outside of the OU football program. But we struggle on the podcast week in and week out. Why – is Brent Venables so undervalued? Why is this higher on the outside of the OU program? People seem to have little to no faith that this is the same guy who produced draft right. pick after draft pick at Clemson, had one of the best defenses in the nation year in and year out at Clemson, won a couple national titles at Clemson. Why does it seem as though that doesn't matter anymore? Is it just because it's easy to get OU fans riled up? Because that, yeah. that's fair. I can support that argument. Yeah, I think that's part of it. I think it, it, it's, it sounds extremely simplistic, but I think it may partially just be because Brent's not overly flashy. Um, he's not Lane Kiffin. He's not going to be tweeting a bunch of crazy stuff. He's not all offense. He's scoring 60 points. Uh, he's an older guy. He's not a young hot shot. He's in his 50s. You know what I mean? It, I don't know. I think it might just be kind of that that simple. He's not. He's been on the radar for so long. I mean, people know Brent Venables is. He's been the DC at one of the most successful programs that there is for the last decade. You know, and Clemson got multiple rings to his name. I think it. I don't know if it. It's a strange thing. And like I said before, you know, there's been a lot made of like he's never been head coach before, and it's like, well, Lincoln had never been. You know, what I mean? it's like these weird things you could easily poke holes in these weird arguments. Um, but you know, we'll see. It's been strange. Um, I think people are having a hard time grasping the, the identity change too for Oklahoma. They become so well known for offense and, and not a lot of defense that it's going to take like, you know, even, even when last year where the defense really was like winning them games at times, it still took people forever to come around to the fact that like, they're not all offense anymore. You know, they really are much more balanced and now it's going to be defense driven, at least at the start, uh, I think, cause it's going to take a little bit of time for this offense to catch up. I think so, you know, it, it, it is strange. Um, I, I think generally national reporters maybe just have a hard time seeing everything. I mean, it's easy for, for me. I cover one team you know. I'm able to see, I mean, I remember seeing, I, I honestly can't even remember who it was. It was like a pre, you know, pre spring top 25 or, you know, so one of those types of things. Oh God. <laughs> and it had notable transfer additions listed for the teams. Then it didn't have for Oklahoma. It didn't even have, it had like five guys and not, and Jeffrey Johnson was not even on there. And I would say he's behind Dylan Gabriel, maybe the next, most important transfer they got and that, that's right. kind of a that's a small example but that's kind of speaks to the larger point of like they just don't see everything with every team so it's kind of important to take all that stuff 
with a grain of salt because Oklahoma did a really good job in the transfer portal. And I think the stuff that's hard to quantify is how much better some of these guys are just going to get by having just better coaching. I mean, Todd Bates is as good of a position coach as there is in college football. Like we don't think that obviously uh, Jeffrey Johnson and Redmond and these guys aren't going to just absolutely take off under him or, or specifically for linebackers has been a big one for me because linebackers were somewhat disappointing last year. That's Brent's forte. And you have a and Deshaun white and these guys who look like NFL players now, like the way their bodies are and stuff, they were kind of underwhelming. I don't think that's going to be an issue now, you know, with, with Brent and this, this, uh, this defensive staff. So, and Schmitty, obviously, you know, getting them to their peak physical condition and stuff like that. So um, it just, I think it may be hard for people to totally grasp all the changes. And also it's important to know that from afar, you know, again, when you watch OU every week and you cover them, you could see how the, the program was not going in the direction that people thought it was going to be going uh, under Lincoln Riley. Whereas I think from a wider lens, people just view Oklahoma as they were just rolling right along. They had another great quarterback. They're playing, you know, all these, they were on track to maybe win the big 12 again. They didn't, they don't see the issues from afar that, that were clearly there when you watch a team every week, they had regrets in 2021 was massively disappointing. I mean, when we did our, you know, preseason show last last year it was championship or not like that was the conversation was this team going to win the natty or not and they obviously didn't even play for the baseball title it was an extremely underwhelming season so i think that's part of it too is that they don't see how it was kind of not going the right direction and that this was a change that ou fans really wanted and as soon as lincoln left it was joe Cilion and this this team they wanted to go a totally different direction and they did brent is the anti-lincoln in almost every way they're totally opposite guys Recruiting philosophy, offense, defense, all of it, personality, they're totally, totally different. And so it's going to take people a minute to kind of uh, adjust to Oklahoma being just, you know, a totally different program now. Awesome. We're going to get you out of here on this. I got one more thing for you and sure. really appreciate your time. But Baylor picked to win the conference. How did your vote shake out if you did vote? And what is – we asked Eric Bailey this during – before the spring sure. game. What is a realistic expectation for OU fans to expect out of this 2022 version of the Oklahoma Sooners? Yeah, full disclosure, I didn't submit my ballot. Um, You're not the I, only one. Some I people think the it. ballots are BS. So yeah. I just figured I'd ask you, you know. Yeah, I didn't do it. I would have picked OU to win the Big 12 if I had. I mean, I, I didn't mean to, and I just, uh, just didn't, didn't get around to it. No one's um, going to be mad at you. No, no but, you know, you look at how many first place votes there are and how many people go to the Big 12 media days. There's a lot of people that don't submit. Their yeah, 100%. I learned that pretty yeah. quick. I was like 17. That's it. There's like hundreds of people there. But yeah, because um, <laughs> yeah. um, they send those ballots to everybody. Yeah, they send them yeah. to everybody. Yeah. yeah, everybody gets a ballot. So um, but I would have picked Oklahoma. I, I think Oklahoma is the best team in the Big 12. Um, I mean, I I have a, a, a high reverence for that defensive staff, especially. I, I just really think that. Miguel Chavis and, and Todd Bates and um, even Jay Valai and Brandon Hall and Venables. And I just think that the, the defense is going to be noticeably better right away. Um, I really do. Cause they have talent there. Like I said, I mean, Jalen Redmond and these linebackers and they have a lot coming back. The secondary should be a lot better. I mean, I look back there, the guys they added Trey Morris in North Carolina. I really like Key Lawrence is going to take a big step up. I think, you know, I think the defense can be a lot better. So I would have picked them to win the big 12. Um, I think they're a really good team. And, and obviously if you win the big 12, you're, you're in position for playoff. If things break your way, I mean, their schedule is relatively friendly again. I mean, they don't have to go. I mean, they go to Lincoln, which is maybe trickier than it would seem because Nebraska was better than their record last year. I don't think that's a gimme by any means, but I think they, their non-conference is pretty, pretty friendly relatively, you know, you know, relative to some past years. They don't have like an Ohio state on there or anything like that. Um, and then, you know, they get to play Baylor at home. Um, they get Oklahoma State at home. They get Kansas State at home. You know what I mean? So schedule's pretty friendly for the most part. Um, I think that they can win the Big 12, certainly. I expect them to. And then when they do, they're probably going to be in the playoff. Now, I think that their talent is going to take a little time to catch up, um, you know, to the top dogs right now. Because this is a transition year. 2021 was supposed to be the year. And then they were going to maybe take a little transition into 23, which supposed to be Caleb Williams' big, big shot at a title next year. But um, they're going to be really good. They're going to be right there. I think they win the Big 12. And and when when you do that, you're pretty much automatically in position to make the playoff. Because I, the way I've always talked about OU for a long time is a one-loss Big 12 champion Oklahoma is going to make the playoff 
99% of the time, barring you know, something very strange to happen elsewhere. And I think that's probably about where they land is no more than one loss. They win the Big 12 and they're in the playoff at the end of the year. And then we'll, we'll see how it shakes out from there. But uh, sky's the limit. I think they're going to be really good. I don't, under, you know, the over under of like nine and a half wins, eight and a half wins. I'm hammering the over. Wild. Yeah. yeah. Crazy yeah. stuff, yeah. man. I don't see where the losses are. Um, no. But, you know, we'll see. And the fact that Dylan Gabriel is the best quarterback in the league, in my opinion, also. So Dude. That, that certainly helps. Josh, He's the only one we've seen do it, yeah. right? It's him or yeah. freaking Adrian Martinez now, and give me yeah. Dylan Gabriel. I yeah. love how I love how we have a like running, not even a joke on the podcast, but we all kind of like try to tell each other to like calm down, like let's not overshoot for the stars or whatever. And then I ask you for like a logical, you know, expectation for the team. You're like, oh yeah, win the Big Twelve and playoff, Play and off, I'm baby. like all in. I'm like yeah. all in. Right? Yeah, I mean, absolutely, one hundred percent. Josh is absolutely I just don't- right. You know, it's but, like I said, I just I look at the schedule and I just don't see where the losses are. That's my main thing. You know, Texas is always going to be tricky. It's always going to be tough. That should be a lot of fun. It's the best game in the world um, getting down there for that. And then but you just look at the rest of the schedule and it's like, like I said, they have all those big games mostly are at home. Um, as long as you avoid a tricky Nebraska loss early, I think they're going to be in pretty good. Pretty good shape. K-State should be better. But again, you get them at home. I mean, it's just schedules pretty friendly. And uh, Dylan Gabriel is, I think, pretty I don't know, pretty wide margin, best quarterback. In the, I mean, he's got 70 touch. It's not like he's, no, you know, coming right. from nobody. He's got yeah. 70 touchdowns and 8,000 yards under his belt. I mean, he was a good quarterback at UCF before with not as much weapons around him and not as good of a line and, and all that. So, yeah, uh, expectations should be pretty high, I think. Mark, anything before we let Josh go? No, I'm good, man. Josh, thank you so much for your time today. Hey, I appreciate it, guys. Once again, be sure to follow Josh on Twitter at Josh M. Callaway. That's M as in Mason. Good for you, you Josh. Uh, be sure to listen to the All Sooners Michael. podcast, <laughs> All Sooners podcast with Josh, and check out All Sooners uh, as he's the assistant editor and multimedia director there. Josh, thanks so much. Have fun at Big 12 Media Days, and uh, be sure to uh, tweet us some cool stuff. Call people program guys, and we'll retweet it every single time. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Oklahoma time. has a lot of those right now. Um, oh, yeah. Porter Moser and, and, and Skip Johnson, they have a lot of program guys right now. Everybody's a lot of good guys at the home. Yeah, Brent Venables is popping up to softball games and junk. He's he's a he's a definition of a program guy. Absolutely. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Josh. Appreciate you guys. Three, two, one. Once again, big thank you to Josh. He was a great interview. Be sure to follow him on all of his social media and follow him throughout the week as we get into Big 12 Media Days. It's a great month of July to be an Oklahoma Sooner, guys. The recruiting mm. is off the charts right now for Brent Venables and his staff. We got Bill Beanbow locking down guys while he's in the Bahamas. We got big time right. names committing to the Oklahoma Sooners. It's it's exciting to see, especially when you know what a commitment to a Brent Venables team means and what Brent has communicated to what a commitment means. So a commitment to Brent Venables means this guy's going to sign. And that's communicated. Granted, these are high school kids. They can change their mind, but – to what Brent Venables, what this means is his class is starting to take shape and it looks really good. Number 11 in the recruiting rankings, recruiting rankings right now, and they're only going to continue to go up. I heard Josh McQuiston on Sooner Scoop on their podcast talking about how he wouldn't be surprised that this is a top seven recruiting class when all said and done. And that's pretty impressive for a Brent Venables team right now. Recruits just looking at it right now who – OU landed in the past week. PJ Adabaware, I believe that's how you say his name. I've heard it a couple of times. I think that's how you say it. Logan Howland, Caden Green, and preferred walk-on Reese Taylor just announced on Tuesday that he is joining the Oklahoma Sooners. So we're going to do, do what we did a little bit, maybe a couple of weeks ago. The, yeah. the last round of recruits, it yeah, seems the la- like, right? The last round of recruits that we took a look at, we're going to, everybody's going to kind of pick a recruit to go over and what they, what they saw. We'll start with Mark, uh, with Phil Pachotti. That's how you say his name as well. Yeah. It's, it's Pachotti, not Pachotti. Yeah. It's Pachotti. I I butchered butchered it. It, 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 Everybody's going to butcher it. It doesn't matter. We're fine. Pachotti. So yeah, I took Phil Pachotti. If you listened a week or two ago, I mentioned him when he, uh, uh, committed and how much I liked his leverage and how he was really good about running to the ball and, uh, you know, dropping low and attacking. And the more I watch him, the more I see that. 
He's got great closing speed. He gets downhill very fast once he diagnoses the play. Kind of just runs through a lot of blockers. You know, unless you body him up, he's going through you. And he's already 6'3", 225. Got to think with an offseason or two in our strength and conditioning program, you get that to a hardened 235 or so. And you're looking at someone with great instincts who's going to be coached by the best. And, you know, I like his chances. But, also, real fast, he's from Pennsylvania. And I just love getting guys from out of region, right? That that this guy didn't go Penn State is awesome. It is not to be under-exaggerated how much Penn State has a like a stranglehold on the state of Pennsylvania. And to go in and get a highly rated guy like that out of Pennsylvania is massive for, for Brent and his staff. That That's so huge. You're absolutely right, Mark. Patrick, who you got? Yeah, speaking of the Northeast, I've got Logan Howland from Princeton, New Jersey. He's a three-star, but in my eyes, this guy's a five-star. Nice. Um, he hasn't been playing uh, – he, so he's an uh, offensive lineman, but he hasn't been playing offensive lineman. He typically plays on the D line and then also plays some tight end here and there. Here and there. So it like, could be cool. Maybe we have a package for him catching some touchdowns, but probably not. Anyway, he is 6'7", 280 pounds. To put that into perspective, that's two inches taller than me, but he has a hundred pounds on me. That is crazy. That's incredible. Nuts. You're skinny, like, Patrick. You're skinny. I know. But yeah, I know. kind of a weird flex on the fat. I'm pushing 185. <laughs> I've been pushing 185. Super health pat right there. <laughs> yeah. California fat. Uh no, but overall, this guy is just like a really good kid. You can totally understand like why he came to the University of Oklahoma because when he speaks, it sounds like he's also preaching like a BB speak. So you can totally tell why like how we're on the same page i think this is another huge win for bill benenball offensive line like great job recruiting this guy he's gonna be a huge guy um and then like just when when he talks in interviews he seems so ambitious every single like interview he has first 30 seconds or a minute he mentions the national football league this guy does not want to stop in college football he wants to play in the league and he came to the university of oklahoma because he felt that this is the best place for him to get into the league. A couple other places he was recruited from, Miami, Iowa, Michigan. His quarterback went to Iowa, and we still beat them out. So another, another big reason he went to OU, we're going to SEC. He mentioned that. We're beating out teams for these guys because we are going to SEC. We are going to be- beat out these Big Ten schools because we're going to the SEC, and I love that. Um, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much all I have on him. He's incredible, good mentality, good head on his shoulders. I'm really excited for, for him and where he where he goes next. Great. Let's stick, with, let's stick with the offensive line. I'll go next. I got Caden Green, four-star offensive lineman. He's the 34th overall player in the country, according to Rivals. It is Bill Beanbow's highest recruit ever. That's saying something with the names that are on Bill Beanbow's list. He's not overly quick. I watched his his sophomore and junior season highlight tapes today. Granted, those are highlights, so, you know, it's not every single play. And I'm not going to claim that I broke down his film for hours upon hours, but seeing what he put out there, he's he's not overly quick, but, man, he he is the biggest dude on the field, and he is the grownest man on the field. 6'5", 310". He finishes blocks with authority. He is he blocks angry like mm. Orlando Brown did. You know what I mean? Like he I don't think he'll end up being a tackle. I think he's going to be more of a guard guy just because he is so like he's round. He's not like he doesn't look like a tackle. Now, a year under Schmidt with that weight. Yeah. Mixing up and getting on a correct diet plan and like they have all their hands on him and they know how to mold him. He could be a tackle and he could be an absolutely great one, but just imagine now he's six, five, three, 10, a season under Schmitty is going to be insane. That guy is easily going to look like a freak of nature. He's overall, he overall, he's a four-star offensive lineman and you want him to be dominant. And he is by all indications he is. And to be the highest rated recruit for Bill Biedenboe, is saying something Oklahoma fans should be extremely excited because he is exactly what you want in an offensive lineman under Bill Biedenboe. He's a dude who could play multiple positions and he's a flat out savage on the field. 
Can I just real fast with both of those guys? Because mm-hmm. they're alignment. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, Bill Pittenbow is winning the offseason. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Pat's got Howland not being a full time O lineman and choosing Beanbow to kind of like teach him how to play offensive line at the next level. That dude's a gigantic mold of clay. And Beanbow's going to have a great time coaching him and, and molding that clay. And someone like Kane Green, the highest guy he's ever gotten. Both of these guys have come under a brand new OC and a brand new head coach. What we're preaching is working on these recruits. Sorry, I won't no, interject anymore. No, you're you're absolutely right. Matt, who who you got now? I'm excited yeah, about Matt, Matt's actually. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah he's fun. Mason, I'll let I'll let you pronounce it. Uh, so I don't want to butcher it if you want to go ahead for me. Is it it's it, no, there's an A in there. Hold on. It's yeah, there Jaquaze. is an A. Like yeah, Jaquaze. Jaquaze. Yeah, That's Jaquaze. what I was gonna say. Jaquay's yeah, pet away. Mm-hmm. Speaking of the offensive side of the football, we've gotten a lot of good defensive recruits, but we also got to have some skill players on the offensive end for <clears> Lemmy <throat> to work with. And this guy, it can be that guy. Four-star wide receiver from Houston, Texas, out of the backyard of Ryan Heil and Mark Hall. We love to see it. He's yeah, not from ton. Houston or anything. That's cool. <laughs> no, you're from you're from California. You just admitted that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Top 10 player. What's the in- same high school as Mark? <laughs> no, just relax, Patrick. Okay. All right. Thanks, man. <laughs> top 10 player in the state of Texas and a top 50 prospect overall. We were in a Red River rivalry recruiting battle. It was between us and Texas at the very end. So what a sweet victory that he committed to us, to our program. Uh, the last two seasons, he's had 105 receptions, 1,800 yards, and 16 touchdowns. From what I was reading uh, from the scouting report and all that, again, I have not watched film myself. This is just simply me learning on my own, got great linear speed and great reliable hands. Maybe can take the top off some defenses that we're looking for. Maybe get some of that Marquez or that Brown, that Hollywood Brown action. We love to see some speed. He also ran track. He went at a 10.41 in a hundred meters. You guys don't know about track. That's pretty freaking fast. <laughs> so Very fast he also time. ran a 20.8 and the 200 meters. So this guy has got some absolute speed that kills, baby. So we love to see it. He's also joining the second wide receiver in the 23 class with Kenyon Brown, who is also a three-star. So big get for the Sooners who were lacking in that skill department, especially on the wide receiver end. So huge for Levy in the offense. Amazing to see. Let us know on Twitter, at Program Guys with a Z, who your favorite recruit, that has just joined the Sooners is I forgot to plug that earlier. Be sure to follow us on Instagram at program guys with a Z on Twitter at program guys with a Z our Facebook page program guys podcast. And as always like, and subscribe on our YouTube channel program guys podcast. Also you can find us wherever you listen to podcasts, Apple podcasts, Spotify, Google podcasts, wherever you find us, you got us guys. Let's move on to our undeniable segment. We're back with it this week. Undeniable greatest running back. In college football history, you're going to make your case for who it is and why. We're going to start start with me. We're going to start with, we're going to start with Mark. Go ahead. No, don't. No, you said don't. Oh, I thought you said do start. No, don't start with me. Don't start with me. Okay. Well, then we'll, I'll I'll go ahead and I'll start. I feel, I feel really gross, guys. I picked like two USC guys. I know. I'm I'm grossed out. So it's, Uh, it's this is a good one, though. It's a weird, thing for me to do but it's i gotta do it for me it's reggie bush and reggie bush for a lot of reasons he's a national champion he has a heisman to his name i don't give a crap that they took it away they can't do it anymore because of nil stuff they need to give it back to him reggie bush with his heisman all of the stats that all of the all americans and more than that he was the running back of a generation When I was coming up in school, everyone in youth football wanted to be Reggie Bush. They wanted to be his his quickness, his cuts, all that stuff. When you think of college football in the early 2000s, you think of Reggie Bush because he was that electric. He returned kicks. He did it all. He was the number one guy on that USC team that you think of with the, the Pete Carroll years. 
I think it's Reggie Bush. And even though he split some carries with Lindale White, I still think he's the guy you think of most synonymously with those USC teams. They wouldn't have won without him. The Bush push, you know, all that stuff is just synonymous with college football and him being the GOAT running back in college football. So Reggie Bush is my guy. Matt, go ahead. Well, hold on, Mason. Yeah. We talk about this every – well, when we do Undeniable, does he meet all four – criteria we have oh, to hold yeah. you to what it. are the criteria yeah. you got yeah. the championship we got the, the championship accolade. the accolades the longevity the three years in college football yeah. that he that he was productive he yeah that counts what's and the fourth one it's stats and i don't have heisman? the stats in front of me but it but they're disgusting so just you know, if you want I mean, a heisman he's got to have some good stats yeah so. i mean just just look at it. you can look them up i don't have them in yeah. front of me but Check, check, I don't feel, check. For, for Reggie Bush, I feel like you don't need to. You know, you you knew what he did, the all-purpose yards, all that all that stuff. I almost cursed. Well, listen, Tyson's not here, but when he listens, I did it for you. Yeah, you kept, thank you. You always keep Mason accountable. I, I appreciate here. it. I got you, buddy. I needed I got it. you. I needed yeah. it. You go ahead That's now, it. Matt. Yeah, guys, I have to with this guy. He's an Ohio State guy, so I feel a little bit of gross, too. But that's okay because he is one of the all-time greats. Better Gotta than go. USC. <laughs> Better than USC. You know? That's true. Ohio State's Archie Griffin. He is the only running back and only player to win back-to-back Heismans. He's the only one that can say that. Three-time All-American, went to or won four Big Ten titles, and went to four straight Rose Bowls. He's the only player to ever do that, ever. And three All-American seasons, he accumulated over 5,500 yards. And all-purpose, he had over 6,500 and 26 touchdowns, and he holds the NCAA record for 31 straight games of 100 yards. And I remember seeing an article, what he was most proud of. It wasn't the Heismans. It wasn't the Big Ten championships. It was 31 straight games. And what he said was how consistent of a performer and an athlete he wanted to be. He proved that in 31 straight games in the Big Ten with Big Ten opponents back-to-back Heismans. I just don't – the only thing he doesn't have is obviously a national championship. Obviously, it was a little bit different back in the 90s. There were some great teams. But to say you've won the Heisman, you're the only person that's won back-to-back years, I feel like that's really hard to beat. I can't wait to hear Mark on this one for his because he is absolutely wrong. Okay. Speaking of – that's a good segue. Segue. We'll go go to Mark now. Let's do it, baby. Matt, I wasn't going to come after you. I feel dirty, too. I picked Oklahoma State's Barry Sanders to be my selection. Now, he doesn't hit one of Mason's criteria in longevity in that he didn't have multiple super-duper lucrative productive seasons. Uh, He had one year of 325 yards, one year of 600 yards, Both years, he's behind College Football Hall of Famer Thurman Thomas. So if y'all aren't going to give him a pass for that, I don't really know what to tell you. I think he deserves a pass for that. I think he does. Thank you. That third season, when Barry Sanders was given the reins, he ran in 11 games, not no, you know, 15 games like teams play this year. In 11 games on 344 carries, he ran for an NCAA record to this day, 2,628 yards. That is, to this day, a average of 7.6 yards a carry, a record that is, to this day, I did that out of order, <laughs> and uh, and an all-time NCAA record to this day of touchdowns in a season. He also, I just counted, in eight of those games, scored more than three touchdowns. In seven of them. He scored more than four touchdowns. The guy was insane. As I said last week, the story of college football is dominant players playing dominantly. And there is no one who has had a more dominant performance for a full season at the running back position than Barry Sanders did for Oklahoma State in 1987. He is undeniably the best college football running back of all time. Okay. Patrick, round us out. I've got... Herschel Walker. I feel dirty too. You should feel real dirty. Yeah. Like right now of you all should. times. 
Anyways, yeah. <laughs> not only did he play football, he played track and field, and he was an All American at both. So, pretty fast guy. Um, but three time All American, three time SEC Player of the Year, graduated 1% in the top 1% of his class. He is in the College Football Hall of Fame. He has a Heisman and he has a natty against Notre Dame, and they would not have won that game unless he was that running back. Um, and then, yeah, total of 49 touchdowns in his three years, an average of 16 touchdowns a season. That's wild. My guy got 10 less than that. Yeah, but, like, if he's doing four in one game, he's obviously playing a bad team. Like, I think that discredits him. No, he was playing in the Big Eight. He was playing in the same conference as Oklahoma, baby. Wow. Well, I, I mean, yeah. You know what I really love? When we do this segment, obviously everyone's got their notes. And mm-hmm. I just know Mark's got his notes written of all the stats and all that. And he practices in the mirror. And at the very end, his last statement, it's always, that's why he's the most undeniable in an inner position. Uh, that's what Mark does. And I love it. You're so oh, good at it, Mark. I am ready to be clipped at all times. <laughs> you are. You definitely are. Uh, you definitely are. Let us know who your undeniable best running back of all time in college football is. Did we get it right? Did we miss somebody? Let us know on Twitter, on Instagram, wherever you can find us. Let us know who you think the undeniable greatest running back in college football is. Let's move on now to our final segment of the week. It is our PGP MVPs of the week. Excited to get to this. Patrick, we're going to start off with you since we just ended with you. Sure. I've got the quick trip Twitter account. Whoever's running that account is hilarious. So a TV reporter in South Bend tweeted at them this week and said, please come to South Bend at Quick Trip. And Quick Trip responded and said, we'll consider coming to South Bend if Notre Dame fans admit play like a champion belongs to the University of Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Bingo. Quick Trip didn't have to potentially upset thousands of customers, but they did. Because they know play like a champion is an Oklahoma saying and that we invented championships. And I thought that was awesome. That That is a good one. Also, quick trip for those who don't know in Oklahoma City. All-time great gas station. It's So I got a friend who it's, it's his favorite restaurant. I'm not joking. His, he says his favorite restaurant is quick trip. As far as gas station food, it's only second to Bucky's. For me and Bucky's is a whole different monster. Yeah. When I when I lived in Virginia, there's a place called Sheets, and Sheets is pretty damn good. Sheets is like really, really good. That's that's, that's like a northeast kind of thing. Hmm. They don't really have them anywhere else. Um, Sheets and Wawa. There's that's the big Wawa, battle. That. That's the yeah. big battle in the northeast right there for, for gas station supremacy. But the <laughs> quick trip I'll always love. The, yeah. Those spicy chicken taquitos got me through every early morning football thing I ever had in high school. It was great. Matt, who you got? That's true. I'm really disappointed you didn't go with the other person. Ah, uh, yeah. You can go with him. Go ahead. No, no. There's only one true MVP, and that is my guy tennis, Novak Djokovic. You guys know I had to do it. Big tennis guy, as you guys are all aware well of and, I guess and knew so. for a very long time. Yeah. Played in the classiest tournament in all the world, Wimbledon, winning his fourth straight Wimbledon title. I didn't say his fourth. I said fourth straight, four years in a row. That is pure dominance. His seventh overall Wimbledon win, notching his 21st Grand Slam, which is putting him one behind the all-time record. Can anyone guess who's got the most all-time Grand Slams? He's still currently playing. Nadal. Yes, Nadal. It is Nadal at 22, the king of clay. This is probably one of the greatest generations of tennis players. If you guys don't watch tennis, you need to. Djokovic, Nadal, Federer, all on the older end of their career, but still dominating people. It's got to be Djokovic, four straight title. Incredible to watch. Love it. I'll go next. I got Tiger Woods as my MVP of the week. I think it's my second time giving Every him week, my we MVP. Tiger Whatever. Keep doing it to him, Mason. Love Look, it. man, it's the British. It's the British Open this week. Going home to the home of golf at uh, St Andrews in Scotland. They're going. It's the 150th British Open. They call it the Open Championship, I guess I should say. Tiger Woods back playing 
after missing the U.S. Open. I'm so excited. He looks good. He's in good spirits. But that's not why he's my MVP. He said today during a press conference, and by today, I mean Tuesday, he said on Tuesday during a press conference, kind of calling out the guys who joined the Live Tour and calling them out in a big way. Tiger doesn't really do that a lot, and he said that they've gone about this the entire wrong way, and now they're going to pay the consequences because he doesn't know if they're going to be able to play major championships. And from a guy who has won a bunch of major championships and knows how important they are to your legacy and how important you are as a golfer, for Tiger Woods to come out and say, I don't know what they're going to do now. It's going to tarnish their legacy. Probably made a lot of those guys on the live tour feel like crap. Now they're probably going to dab their eyes with their, you know, wads of hundred dollar bills, but still it's in the, in the grand scheme of golf for Tiger Woods, who's at the very tip top of the sport telling you that you're a piece of crap means a lot. So that's, that's where I'm at. I don't care if someone wins the Live Golf Championship 20 times. They will never be a legend of golf. No, never. Never. I'd encourage everyone to go look for the, the actual full quote. It's pretty long. It but is. Tiger is super, like you can tell he has thought about this from a lot of different angles. And uh, things that I wasn't thinking about, things that I just didn't know. Um yeah, go look it up because he has he has a lot of interesting thoughts on that. Good call, Mason. Yeah, but he looks he looks good this week. He he's walking around. He's looking okay. He's goofing around with guys. I'm very excited. Once again, just hope he makes the cut. I would just love to see him on a Sunday. That's all I really care about. All right, who who's our last? Who rounds it out, Mark? It's it's me because I was last um, putting mine in. So I'm gonna. So my MVP is all of our collective Oklahoma fandom. And I did this to cover two things. One is the like awesome recruiting uh, trip that we're on right now. We are just, we have crushed July so far and there's more to come it seems. So shout out Boomer Sooner. The next is I was told by a person the other day that horns down is quote, like the C word. And I'm not going to say it, obviously, unquote. No. And I'm like, man, how'd you get there? Yeah. How'd, you, how'd you ever get there? We are so in the heads of these other teams. Rent free. New coach doesn't matter. We've got, we are coming and we are pulling these guys from Pennsyl- Pennsylvania, from Princeton, New Jersey. We are going all over the country and we are pulling them in because there's something different about what's happening in Norman, Oklahoma and Oklahoma fandom is my MVP of the week. Love it. Also jumping back real quick on our undeniables, Ryan wanted to give him credit. He had Adrian Peterson as his undeniable running back in college football history. Shout out to Ryan for getting that in. Also let us know once again, who your undeniable is tweet us at program guys with a Z big, sorry, lost my train of thought. Big 12 media days coming up today. On Wednesday, Oklahoma and Brent Venables will not speak today. Reminder, they will speak on Thursday. You can catch all that action. However, the Big 12 is going to get it out into the etherverse. I don't don't really know what they're going to do. Go follow Josh Calloway for up-to-the-minute updates. Go follow Josh. And and real quick, sorry, this is kind of inside baseball, but whatever. What Josh was talking about in the interview that I wanted to specify, he talked about breakout sections that – where the the journalists go get to interview other players and stuff. That's not the big stage where 200 journalists get to ask questions. The breakout session is literally you sit at a table, like a normal size table, and it's like a media scrum. And people can come up and spend 20 minutes talking to you if they want, or they can go talk to somebody for five minutes. And that's where you get all the quotes that – are going to be passed around this week that you see from Steve Sarkeesian and Brent Venables and Dylan Gabriel and, and all those other big names. That's where the quotes are really going to come from because that's where guys get to ask specific questions about things and not broad generalities about like, Hey Brent, how do you think your team's looking this year? It's going to be like, what do you think of Bray Walker this year? Has he made the improvement that you needed to see? It's going to be stuff like that. So be on the lookout for that. 
That's what he was talking about. I just want to specify that because I remember during the interview that he said that. Once again, massive thank you to Josh. Be sure to follow him on all of his social media as the Big 12 Media Days rolls out. Guys, anything else before we get out of here? Yeah, we're saying Long, long show this week, only four of us, but who cares? We gave it to the people. Football season is back, my people. Mm. Big 12 Media Days. It's the official start of football season. Thank you so much for listening this week. Be sure to like and subscribe on our YouTube channel. Follow us however you get your podcast, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, whatever, on Twitter at Program Guys with a Z, Instagram Program Guys with a Z, Facebook page, Program Guys Podcast. However you get it, we love being here. We love hearing from you guys. Follow us, like us, all that stuff. Patrick, take us out. Keep pushing it, baby.